In America, we have 90% of people who believe in God. Yes. And a large portion of those people, and you know as being an Irish Catholic growing up that way, feel homosexuality is sinful based upon what's in the Bible. So their thinking is, why put any child into a home that's sinful? Do you respect that point of view? No, I don't, because I think that somebody's values and their morals are shown best in the way they treat others and their children and the world in general. It's not necessarily the way that they respond sexually and emotionally to the person they choose to live with. There are some heterosexuals that have heterosexual behavior that is appalling sexually, that is deviant and bad and not really moral and Christ-like and biblical, but those people are never questioned as to whether or not they're allowed to be a parent. I know the teachings of Jesus Christ. I know what they are. Kindness, love, compassion, empathy, understanding. Do you think he's going to look at you negatively uh, when you die because of your homosexuality? No way. Because he was there for the first 20 years. I think God's happy I can love in any capacity. But there are others who are all too willing to judge. They love to sharpen their arrows, identify their target, and let those around them know what God really thinks. Tell the people about the good news that he does save lives. There is a heaven and warn the wicked that they are going to hell. If you don't, you might go to hell yourself on judgment day. I encourage all you young people to uh, uh, get signs and come out here at these rock concerts and Bible tracks from your church and start spreading the word and warning these kids are going to go to hell, that's your job. And if you don't do it, on Judgment Day, when these people go to hell, they'll say, Well, nobody ever told us we were going to hell. Nobody was ever down there. If we were going to hell, the loving Christians would have come down and said, Repent. Well, I'm down here. Unfortunately, these are often critical people who not only judge others with the wrong attitude, but for the wrong reasons. Often they judge others not because of some actual breach of biblical conduct or doctrine, but because of petty taboos or minor infractions. I believe that Jesus speaks to both groups when he said, Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Did Jesus mean that we do ourselves a favor if we make no judgments, since such judgments will return upon our own heads? I think not. Just consider the immediate context of Jesus' words. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and then turn and tear you to pieces. How could we possibly obey these instructions unless we learn to recognize dogs and pigs? Jesus is making a powerful statement about the need for discrimination and discernment, for learning to distinguish between what is clean and unclean, evaluating what is wise and what is foolish. A few verses later he says, Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. How could we be aware of false prophets unless we can identify them? We are supposed to be looking for certain distinguishing marks of false teachers so that we can avoid them and warn others. An entire episode of this series will be devoted to this. Jesus was not teaching that we should not make judgments, but rather that we should not make pharisaical judgments. The Pharisees judged the wrong things and for the wrong reasons. How can we be guarded from Pharisaism on the one hand and mindless gullibility on the other? What are the parameters to guide us as we exercise discernment? Let me introduce three principles that will help us make biblical judgments. First of all, our attitude should be one of humility, not superiority. Let's consider Jesus' humorous illustration. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? 
Now the eye represents the soul and obviously it is important that it be free of impurities. Now I want you to visualize a man with a plank in his eye walking through the lobby of a church trying to find someone with a speck of sawdust in his eye that he might remove it. Now if he were more honest he would take the plank out of his own eye first. You know, here's a basic principle of human nature. People often see the sawdust in another's eye as a plank, and they see their own plank as a speck of sawdust. Christ's point is this. We have no right to judge others until we have been willing to admit the truth about ourselves. The more humble we are, the more mercy we will show to others. And those who have been given great mercy should exercise mercy. Those who have stood in need of grace should invite others to accept great grace. Second, we must judge facts and not presumptions. Fragments of information will be sufficient for those who have already made up their minds about the conduct and beliefs of others. Some people think that they have the right to connect the dots and to draw conclusions based on their own intuitions, hunches, and prior desires. If they are angry or savor a critical spirit, they will be likely to jump to conclusions. No wonder we read in the book of Proverbs. He who answers before listening, that is his folly and his shame. Third, we must judge biblical issues, not preferences. Some things are always right. We should always love one another. We should always abhor that which is evil. We should always do good to all men. On the other hand, some things are always wrong. It is always wrong to hate. It is always wrong to love evil or commit adultery. But there are some things that fall in between these two clearly defined spheres. The point is that we have no right to judge others in matter of conscience where there is latitude of conduct and belief. When we judge, we should be able to point to a verse of scripture or a scriptural principle that undergirds our opinions. Because ultimately we are concerned about what God has revealed, not our preferences and personal convictions. The ability to make judgment lies at the heart of Christian living. Unless we are able to judge doctrine, lifestyles, and entertainment, unless we are able to distinguish between outer appearances and inner character, we just might miss the purpose for which God placed us on this earth. We might end up accepting a stone for bread and a snake for fish. Of course we don't claim perfection. We do not claim to make final judgments. We do not claim that we are above those whom we judge. We do, however, affirm that we are commanded to study the scriptures to find the truth about two simple questions. What does God want us to believe? And how does he want us to live? We affirm that we have the responsibility of living by these truths and encouraging others to do the same. Discernment as we shall see, determines our destiny. I don't care what you believe. I care about the way you live. That's what a churchgoer said when I asked him about his understanding of the gospel. He was impatient, he said, with those who quibbled about minor points of doctrine when there were such great needs in the world. Doctrine, he said, just gets in the way of the more important issues like integrity and compassion. Now, no doubt, too much time has often been spent on doctrinal quibbles. But there can be no topic on planet Earth as important as the question of how one gets to heaven. Truth be told, we cannot get to heaven without the right beliefs. Sound doctrine determines a sound faith. There is a connection between belief and behavior, between doctrine and destiny.